And welcome back to Watch Is Live. It's the only show we shoot right here on Watchbox Reviews. Fellows, I have an incredible array of sports watches, dress watches, simple watches, and complications, as well as quite a few personal favorites, so this is a special night tonight. Remember, folks, we have an eBay auction that is running from the 31st of March through the 6th of April. The only chance you've ever had to name your price and bid on our watches. We normally do buy it now on eBay. Be sure to check the Watchbox eBay auction. Friends, join in from around the world. We have Eric Cecil from New York City. We've got Hell Bop joining right in and Russell996 from the UK. Let's jump into the watches I promised you in the thumbnail. First and foremost, the Rolex Daytona. And this is one we haven't seen in a while, but launched in 2016, the white dial ceramic bezel was initially the more popular of the two. And I've seen the shift of tastes against that grain as it seems the black dial is the dominant watch of the moment. Well, this was the original heartthrob, 40 millimeters black serochrome ceramic bezel, a white dial, and it is white. It is chalk white, not silver metallic. The timepiece is handsome and easily wearable. It's a graceful case. The Daytona always looks a little bit like a fusion of a sports watch and a dress watch and some lines, some of them downright and decent. You can see in particular the crown guard profile is sexier than any sports watch has a right to be. Now you turn it onto the dial side and you can see that it's the contrast between those black sub registers and the white of the dial that really makes this model and that's lacking in the black dial model. While I prefer the black dial model, this one is more dramatic overall. That said, it is not even close to the most dramatic Rolex Daytona on the table tonight. That honor goes to my color-coordinated Rolex Cosmograph Daytona Beach. The 116519 White Gold 2001 Daytona Beach Series was a four-part set. Three watches with dyed mother of pearl, pink, yellow, and blue. There was a fourth watch with a chrysophrase green dial. All of them extraordinary in white gold with a lizard strap. This one in hot pink. This is Miami Beach style pink. And you can see that it is truly lizard as inside the strap, genuine Rolex lizard strap. It is a very different look, both in the scale pattern and the color. And you can see how it's perfectly keyed to a dial that is in fact pink mother of pearl. It has almost a holographic 3D effect. The printing of the dial as well as the white gold indices and numerals seem to float atop rather than sit on. It's a remarkable effect in person because it has almost a prismatic ability to throw off every color from silver to green, violet, blue, and all colors in between. This is the Daytona Beach, a rare 2001 series. You think this is crazy? Well, one of these, the green chrysophase, sold for $73,000 at auction a few years back, so collectors are beginning to discover these. While it is called the Daytona Beach series, I call it the Miami Beach series, because come on, just look at that strap. That's Miami Beach neon for your wrist. Jumping into the box, I can see Eric Cecil asking bubblegum scented. I wish, that's my favorite gum flavor. And we could see Portia Maven joining us from Montreal. Jay Ballard greeting from Albuquerque. And I see Andrew ST, WST12 joining us with Hunky X Machina. And he's saying Daytonas get better the more outlandish they get. Good point. O'Neill Miller saying mother of pearl for his wife. You buy it for her, you're going to be a hero, my man. And JBO Surf joining us from Adelaide Naresh Pape from Toronto. Actually, he's greeting us from sunny LA this time. That guy gets around. Mark S. Tim, I think Michael Mann wore a white dial Daytona when filming Collateral. We've got a Michael Mann favorite on the table tonight. We're going to get to that. Jumping in, Jacob Casper joining us from Austin and Abdul, my friend from the Black Forest of Germany joining us in. This is my favorite Rolex on the table. Of the two Daytonas, you guys know which one I prefer, but this is the Rolex that I would buy with my own money new to get the full five-year warranty and the new Rolex experience, the Milgauss Z Blue, a watch that launched back at Basel World 2014 and is incredibly remaining among the ranks of the living, still in the catalog despite prodigious rumors this year, iridescent blue dial, orange accents, orange lightning bolt seconds hand, and you can see that green tinted GV glass ver crystal that's been part of the line since 2007. It's the dial that sells this one for me. I'm usually a green fanatic. It's this blue. This thing could electrocute you. It is shooting off sparks. 40 millimeters. We're going to start doing some wrist shots. You guys already know my Zen Easy M11, so we're not going to do a shot. You guys can see this. It's on the header bar graphic of the web page that you're looking at right now. I'm going to show you the Z Blue because it wears differently than most 40mm Rolex sports watches because it doesn't have a bezel. 
It doesn't have a stationary bezel of Cerachrom. It doesn't have a mobile bezel of metal with a Cerachrom cap. It's an outlandish thing, and yet it is graceful. It's reasonably sized, and you could wear it with a dress cuff. 100 meters, 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic, of course, mil gauss, 1,000 gauss, an incredible watch, and probably the craziest watch Rolex has released since the Daytona Beach. Jumping into the chat box, Thomas Burnett saying, I love me some Z Blue mil gauss. You better believe it. O'Neill Miller saying Daytona 116500. The Pepsi and then the Z Blue. Those are his favorites. Well, I've got a favorite on the table tonight that we don't discuss often enough because it's one of the best buys and dive watches, but it's from a smaller brand, better associated with the name Bucherer, the retailer, than Bucherer, the watch manufacturer. So Carl F. Bucherer, since 2001, has been the brand of Bucherer, a billion dollar European based jewelry and watch monster that is essentially the place to get your watch on the continent in Europe. In 2013, they launched the Petravi Scuba Tech that you see here. 44.5 millimeters, it's only 13.1 millimeters thick. You see it has the helium escape valve on its flank. It has a ceramic set bezel that has a wonderful detent. I'm actually going to put it right up to the microphone so you can hear just how chunky this one is. One of the best bezel actions you'll find. No expense spared. Ceramic in red and black. You have this almost... I would call it almost a prismatic metallic black. You can see the little manta rays on the dial. And yes, they are manta rays, as you can see from the case back. Proceeds go to manta ray conservation. But there's a combination of metallic and gloss that creates the effect you're seeing right here. All applique indices. There's a COSC certified Salida SW200 inside. So it is a chronometer. It's 500 meters. It has the richest bracelet this side of Rolex. This feels like a Rolex bracelet. And it's the only bracelet that I will pronounce easy equal in substance and features to a Rolex. Now here's the thing, on one hand, you get a slider. You see how you can push the button and you can slide the adjustment in or out based on your needs. You can make those incremental adjustments. So you've got an incremental adjustment that you can pull out for a dive suit. But you've also, on the other side, got a conventional fold-out dive extension. You wind up with both. So if you want to go full extension, you can pull out the slider and you can pull out the fold-out. Of course, the case back featuring a handsome image. It's a Salida SW200 COSC, so very accurate, but not very exciting. I prefer the manta rays. This watch at 44.5 is large, but you can see it does fit on my wrist. This is a watch that retails for about half the price of a Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe, but it feels every millimeter the equal in substance, in features, and in wrist presence. I would compare this to a 50 Fathoms, not the Bathyscaphe, the full fat 5015. It's simply that impressive. That or a Rolex Sea Dweller 43. It's that good, guys. You don't have to pay a bundle to get that level of quality. You just have to look beyond the usual suspects. One of the best values out there, especially pre-owned. And I can see Thomas Burnett is a fan of that Glidelock-style bracelet. And J.B. Oates saying, Tim, best dive watch with internal rotating bezel. With an internal rotating bezel? Hmm. I would have to say, all things considered, I am not averse to naming the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Scuba the best choice. That's one from back in the mid-2000s. It is super slim for an offshore. The Royal Oak Offshore Scuba, you're going to have to go back. It's the equivalent of a modern-day diver. That's the best internal rotating bezel for fit and for appearance, as well as patrimony and pedigree. It's an AP with a JLC movement. What could, go, what could possibly go wrong with that? Okay, speaking of JLC, we've got two great ones on the table. A wonderfully wearable Master Home Time. This was a 2013 model launch in 40 millimeters, black dial, stainless steel. They don't get much better than this. You can see it's full-sized, but not oversized. It's discreet. You wouldn't know this is an Aston Martin-inspired watch. And although it's not part of the Amvox series, it is the Home Time Aston Martin, which means you have a very small and minimal Aston Martin Ghosted Wing logo under the JLC logo that you could barely see. I, I mean, it's not even visible on the dial of this watch, and you guys are looking at it at close range. There you see it right there, and I'm actually okay with that. This is the most attractive version of this watch. You can see it features, see if we can break the travel time away from its local hour hand. This is easier to do when you're not looking at the watch backwards. Okay. 
You can see how there's a travel time hand with a red lacquered index at the end. You've got the 24 hour dial that corresponds to that travel time hand right there. You have all diamond polished hand finished dart style indices. You have loom and on the case back you have the full sized, I should say properly sized modern JLC caliber 975H. It's the auto tractor. It's nicely made with heat blued screws, not chemically dyed. Full balance bridge with a free sprung balance like a Rolex. 48 hour power reserve, unidirectional winding, ceramic rotor bearings. This one with the dual time complication and a longa manufactured hairspring. Yes, that longa that's laser welded at both the stud and the collet for further stability against chalk. This is a very tough dress style watch. In fact, as tough as they come, that is JLC's most robust and most modern automatic movement in there. Not counting the 77. The, se the 77 or 770 is more modern, but it's based on the same architecture. That is the most modern JLC architecture. That said, it's not the most interesting JLC on the table tonight. Not this time. Tonight we are going to debut the first ever Amvox 7 on the show. In fact, on the channel. I've never reviewed one of these. This was the end of the line for the Amvox series, the seventh and the last. It bowed at SIHH 2012, 44 millimeters in titanium. It features the articulated pusherless chronograph concept that JLC first presented in 2006 with the Amvox 2. Now you can see how, let's make sure it's unlocked, you can see how there is no chronograph pusher. You push 12 o'clock to start it. You can see the chronograph is moving. You push 12 o'clock to stop it. You push 6 o'clock to reset, and you got to push it hard. But the bottom line is it's designed to be pushed on your wrist. And you can see how there is a articulated case back. It pivots here, and it pivots here. It's also remarkably clever because it uses JLC's quick release system. This was not on the original Amvox 2, only available on the Amvox 7 of the series. Now, you see you pull it back and you just take the strap off like that. It's that simple, and because it's a little shutter system, you can see how it actually works, it just pulls the lugs back. As a result, you can use conventional straps on here. You don't have to buy a proprietary strap to use this quick release lug system. There's also a super cool radial power reserve that's up at 12 o'clock. This is a feature that was brought over from the Extreme Lab 2, and you can see as I wind it, the power reserve converges on the top of the dial. It's a twin mainspring barrel, 65 hour power reserve, and you can see how that red expanse of the reserve is heading towards the top. And like an automotive fuel gauge, it moves from empty to F, F for full, right at the top. This watch is heavily Aston Martin inspired, as from the 1920s through the 1990s, Aston Martin cars featured Jaguar gauges. So this is not astroturfed history. This is not just branding of convenience. This is real history here as the two companies have a long heritage together. You can see the fuel filler style crown and you can see how the bottom of the dial is not calibrated because the calibrations of the dial are designed like a tachometer or a speedometer on a dashboard with a Aston Martin grill style motif on the center dial. A very cool watch with a ton of features, column wheel vertical clutch chronograph and a locking system on the side that allows you to lock the chronograph so you ultimately can't use it, can't reset it, or in the middle position you can use any of the functions so you don't accidentally fat finger a reset while the chrono's running during a 24 hour race. A little bit fanciful, but a wonderful piece. You can even see the recentering hammers of the chronograph down at six o'clock through the skeletonized dial. That's a really cool piece, and a 44 that wears compact. I can see Sean is joining. I could see high and rising in there. Any reports on how well that pusherless chronograph system works in the field? Yeah, I owned one for years. I had one for four years. I never had a problem with it, and it was cheap to service. I serviced that thing for JLC. $910 is going to be the average service cost for one of those, which is a darn bargain when you consider what goes into it. Especially when you consider what a basic AP costs to service. Jumping straight in, I can see El Senor and Marco joining in. Welcome, guys. That guitar guy in the comments section, my fellow guitar player, he's saying he needs it. I owned one, the Amvox 2 version. Not quite as many features, but quite cool. You would not regret. Okay, if we have a theme on the table tonight, Oddly enough, it's Gerard Perregaux, and 
We're starting off with two Ferraris from the Halcyon days of the 1994 to 2004 GP Ferrari matchup. Now this is another case of automotive and watch co-branding gone right, not wrong. This was one of the best series. You can see right here I've got the 8020. It's 38 millimeters with a rose gold bezel, an iridescent blue metallic dial, and it is an automatic chrono in stainless steel and rose gold. As you can see, the bracelet goes straight through with a wonderful and contemporary use of rose and steel two-tone. Luigi Macaluso was the leader of GP and a former European rally champion in the 90s. Luca Montezemolo was the president and CEO of Ferrari during that period. They were friends, both Italians, both industrialists, both into high performance machinery. As a result, this partnership was born. It feels organic, authentic, and right. So you have the 8020 right here with that extraordinary dial and the rose gold bezel. And then you have the 8090 right here. Now this one is a Gerard Perigo in-house base with a chronograph module that produces a radial minutes display. So you can see you have chronograph minutes at center with chronograph seconds. So it's super easy to read. This is the Gerard Perigo Ferrari 250 GT Tour de France, named after the 77 cars from the 1956 to 1959 250 GT Tour de France series. The dial is a different kind of metallic blue. It's it's not quite as luminous and lustrous. It's not as glossy as the other. It's a little bit more grown up, a little bit more muted. That said, note that this is a remarkable automatic chrono in 40 millimeters that has no date. There is a perfect symmetry about this dial and it is gorgeous. I'm gonna throw it on the wrist. This is Gerard Perigo watchmaking at its absolute best. Uh, a timepiece that is built inside and out by GP. They build the movement, they also build the case and the bracelet. Because when GP says that they date back to 1791, they were talking about a company called Bout, which was a case and bracelet maker that they purchased in the early 20th century. And so GP makes its cases and its bracelets as well as its movements. This is about as good as a 40 millimeter in-house caliber sports chronograph gets. And if you're into the Ferrari connection, it's a wonderful one. The product of two friends who were in the car and the watch industry, and you could see the image of the Ferrari 250 Tour de France GT on the case back. This was a series from 1999. The anniversary of the production of the last of the 250 GTs. They made 2,000 of these watches. Jumping straight in, we've got another GP of a very different persuasion. Made in 1966 in 1,000 copies, this is the Gerard Perigo Deep Diver 8867W. As handsome as any vintage Rolex, Omega, Jager Le Coult, or Volcane. This is a 39mm stainless steel diver, and you can see it even has an intact plexiglass cap over its bi-directional rotating old-school dive bezel. Uh, the watch is 48mm lug-to-lug, which means it wears modern. It doesn't seem petite or undersized. And inside is Gerard Perigo caliber 3219 based on the Adolf Schild 1738 with uh, the Gerard Perigo in-house automatic winding system and it is a remarkable system. You can see the original tritium dial and the original bezel. This is old school Gerard Perigo watchmaking and a 60s dive watch at its finest. Only a thousand of these made. How many survived in this condition? You better believe it's only a handful. Beautiful. And a gyromatic here. I'm going to show you the dial and I'm going to show you the bezel. The gyromatic was Gerard Perigo's in house winding system. So they put that on top of the Adolf Schild base movement to create a handsome hybrid in house caliber with a diver that is all vintage 60s style. And look how intact the lug be bevels are. This is a vintage watch that doesn't show any signs of age. It's almost as if someone put this in a drawer and forgot about it. Well, they're, they're lost, but your gain. This is a wonderful time capsule piece. And I rarely call a vintage watch a time capsule. Uh, jumping straight in, we have more Gerard Perigo, a latter day sports watch from GP. This was a product of Luigi. Macaluso actually canvassing the field of professional drivers in Europe to see what they wanted in a motorsports chronograph. And in the mid-2000s, the R&D 01 right here was the answer. 43 millimeters in stainless steel, there's a lot going on. So let's get close to the dial. Harrison's going to get us super close, and you're going to see all of the features that this watch has. I was asked earlier in the show about internal rotating bezels. Well, let me show you a watch that has one. You screw out the crown that's down at 4 o'clock, and now you have access 
to the internal rotating bezel. So you can use this as a reference point, line it up with the minute hand, and now you have a second reference. Just like the 8090 we just saw, there is a central register for chronograph minutes. That little yellow arrow is chronograph minutes. You can see chronograph seconds in the varnished red hand. You have constant seconds at what would normally be nine o'clock. You have a radial date down at six, and then you have a pusher adjuster on the case blank for the radial date. Finally, you have a 24-hour subdial that corresponds to the time at center. That 24-hour dial gives you AM-PM distinction. The watch is fully loomed and dramatically so at night with a carbon fiber dial, and you can see it's an inverted chronograph. The idea being it's simply easier when the watch is on your wrist to use your thumb to start, stop, and reset. And you can see the good effect that Luigi Macaluso had the right idea. Start, stop, and reset using your thumb. This is the ultimate motorsports chrono on the case back. The CO33 in-house caliber, nicely executed. This is a big watch, but all the same, it's got the wrist presence that's justified by its many functions. A watch that can really fill up your forearm if you like the big watch look, but won't monopolize your arm if you're like me and you don't have a huge wrist. 16 centimeters and I'm wearing that 43 just fine. Gerard Perigo is here to surprise and amaze, and I realize GP has eaten up the whole show, but it was kind of worth it. This, launched in 2016, was the successor to 2013's GPHG Aguidor Grand Prize winner. This is the 46 millimeter titanium Gerard Perigo Constant Escapement LM. Twin mainspring barrels, caliber 90, 100, six day manual wine power reserve, but gets super close, and you can see the buckle effect constant force escapement. So you can see that little rocker. There is a razor slim band of silicone that runs from this side and this anchor all the way to this side. And what these little wheels do is they actually impulse the rocker that's attached to that little band of silicon. And past a certain point, if you can imagine playing with a ball game ticket, like a piece of paper in your hand, you squeeze it po past a point and it snaps. And it's that quality of silicon. It will buckle after a certain point when it's under pressure. It snaps and it impulses the balance. So it uses the inherent elasticity of silicon to create a modern day constant force escapement. Believe it or not, in 1998, Nicolas Dehon, who designed this system for Gerard Perigot, prototyped it before the use of silicon for Rolex. Rolex never finished the patent, and thus Dehon went to GP, and over the course of the next 12 years, he perfected the system and brought it to life to win the GPHG Grand Prize for Gerard Perigot. The watch is 53.5 millimeters lug to lug, which means you can wear it on a smaller wrist. All in titanium, it's very light. It's, an, it's a GPHG Grand Prize winner. That one was 48, this one was 46. Same movement, you get all that pedigree, but with a more wearable size. This one is a thoroughbred. Okay, jumping straight in. Ahmad B saying, nice, but we'll never buy. Thomas Burnett, nice skeleton movement. And I could see we've got a lot of folks who think this is an interesting piece. And I've got to admit, it's not necessarily the most exotic movement we've got on the table. That honor probably goes to the 50th anniversary white gold, 18 karat baguette caliber of the Corum Golden Bridge, a prism of white gold and sapphire, 32 millimeters wide by 50 millimeters lug to lug. It's only 10.4 millimeters thick. You can see that the caliber 7000, as designed by AHCI co-founder Vincent Calabresi in 1980 for 2005, the 50th anniversary of Corum. It was executed entirely in white gold. It's 15 millimeters long and five millimeters wide, 19 jewels, manual wind. You can see it's also freehand engraved in solid white gold. You have the winding action and the crown on one end. You have the movement, you have the escapement on the opposite end, you have the balance. The length of the movement literally traverses the entire drive the escapement and the balance and you can see when you put this white gold watch on the wrist it wears low it wears sleek it's easy to fit even on a small wrist it's compact it's even thin it's gorgeous and it's an original an in-house caliber by Corum made of solid gold designed by Vincent Calabresi in a wearable tonneau case it doesn't get any better than this Corum bridge white gold 50th anniversary lots of friends here and I have to admit, a lot of you guys are into Omega, and I've got quite a few of them on the table tonight. You've got two flavors of calendar Aquaterra. Omega Seamaster Aquaterra, you can have the day date, 
with black dial, the day date featuring a 41.5 millimeter case and the day and the date complication or 38.5 millimeters with rose gold accents on a silver dial, you have the Aquaterra annual calendar, 38.5 millimeters. You can see that you have the month and you have the date and this will only require adjustment once per year, the jump from February to March and I can show you exactly how this works right now. It's an annual calendar which means 30 day months are no problem for this watch and it's fun to have something that's a little bit of an exotic complication on your wrist as the annual calendar was invented by Patek Philippe in 1996 so to be able to get that in Omega feels downright special and it is a fun thing to watch turn over. You'll find yourself staying up until midnight simply to enjoy the sight of your watch popping through the calendar turn. Let me see. Okay, so we're going to watch what happens right here. Hang on, let me, let me, let me turn that from March to April. There we go. Now you can see as I turn this annual calendar through the date chains, you're going to watch it jump straight to May at the stroke of midnight. And I will slow down as I approach and we'll watch that calendar roll right over to May 1st. That's an annual calendar, folks. 150 meters water resistant, 38.5 millimeters, very compact, just over 40 five millimeters lug to lug. This is one you can really wear on any wrist. And I would say that depending on your taste, you might go for one of the darker dials. You might go for this silver dial, but it's a dream to wear on the wrist. It's an all the time watch. It's got plenty of loom, plenty of water resistance, 60 hour power reserve, coaxial chronometer, and the annual calendar complication. All that you need in a single 38.5 millimeter stainless steel case. I've also got a bit of a rarity, as I don't often talk about this watch because I don't often have it on the table, but it's the Aquaterra 43mm Chronograph GMT, column wheel vertical clutch chronograph, 60 hour power reserve, coaxial chronometer, you can see it has a 24 hour power reserve, it has a tri-register chrono, all on a double register style, teak deck metallic blue dial, a stunning piece, it is a large watch, but it's just over 50 millimeters lug to lug, even with the bracelet included, so the solid end links don't make this one too big to wear, it actually looks almost petite compared to a comparably sized Planet Ocean, so a big one, but it does a good job of hiding its size. A timepiece you could wear even on a small wrist and again it's got all the works. Chronograph, a date, and a dual time. You better believe this is an all-arounder. Nicely loomed and highly water resistant too. Let's jump into a few exotics. Alanga Unzona, the datagraph. This more precisely is the Duforograph. Reference 403031, 39 millimeters in red gold with the black dial. This model was only made from 2003 to 2005. You can see that sterling silver dial, galvanized black. This is one of the few modern watches that Philippe Dufour owns and wears, but which he did not make himself. So it has the ultimate imprimatur of a master who truly loves and wears the watch on a regular basis. Now 39 millimeters, 47 millimeters lug to lug, anyone can wear this. It's a flyback chronograph, it's beautifully made, it's a handsome piece, but all the action is on the case back. Longa caliber L9511. It's a flyback chrono. You can see that lateral clutch moving in and out. You can see when it moves away, the recentering hammers falling on the hard cam at center. Beautiful, deep, lustrous, golden, blue, violet, silver, all of that and such depth. You can look at it from an angle. It's like peering into the engine bay of a 1950s Ferrari. Everything is gorgeous and you can see all of it, not like a modern car. This almost doesn't feel like a modern watch with the exception of the fit, finish, and the quality, which is very 21st century. The datagraph. It's a wonderful piece because on top of everything else, it's a classic and it's a flyback. An undersold advantage of the dado. Now jumping into another watch that ups the ante, a watch featured, I believe, in Miami Vice. We were talking about Michael Mann movies. This is the 47112, launched back in 2000. It is the Malt Chronograph, the Malt Perpetual Calendar Chronograph, featuring a platinum case. This one is 39 millimeters and thus eminently wearable on almost any wrist. The watch is only about 13 millimeters thick and about 48 millimeters lug to lug. This is a great complicated watch for a smaller wrist or those with a taste for traditional sized complications. Perpetual Calendar, Chronograph, all in platinum and and on top of everything else, a uh, Vacheron Caliber 1141 visible beneath a platinum hunter style case back. Lamagna based, just like the late great Patek Philippe 5970. 
Vacheron still using this movement, finishing it to the highest degree. It does not get any better than this. Column wheel, lateral clutch, and gorgeous. You can pick one of these up for a fraction of the price of a 5970. And note that freehand engraved, solid white gold moon face with the smiling and the melancholy moon down at 6 o'clock. How cool is that? Now, if you want to watch that does almost the same thing for a whole lot less money, annual calendar chronograph from Zenith. This is the El Primero Windsor Annual Calendar Chronograph Boutique Edition from about six years ago. It features a smoked fume dial made of hallmarked precious metal palladium. That's right, it is a smoked palladium dial. Stainless steel, 42 millimeters. It's an annual calendar featuring a Zenith El Primero base. This caliber 4054 features a Ludwig Oxlin designed annual calendar that uses the same mechanism with all of nine additional pieces that he designed for the MIH watch. Oxlin, of course, now of Oxen Jr., designed the great celestial complications and perpetual calendars for Ulysse Snorden during the 90s and the 2000s. Well, this is his baby. 42 millimeters in stainless steel, annual calendar chronograph, smoked palladium dial. It doesn't get any better than this. Of the watches on the table tonight, it's between the Milgauss Z Blue and this for the watch that I want most personally for my own collection. Guys, thank you for all who joined. We're going off with a bang. This is a watch that simply cannot be followed. De Bethune DB28 steel wheels. 42.7 millimeters in grade 5 titanium. 25 pieces for the whole world. You can see it features a 360 degree spherical moon face of blued titanium and palladium. It has a skeletonized delta style bridge over two mainspring barrels atop the caliber 2115 v4 manual wind six day power reserve you can see there's a power reserve indicator on a case back that is rife with perlage turn it all over and on the dial side you can see there is a titanium hour track with spherical titanium our indices and a blued titanium chaptering underneath. This is as good as it gets in modern high horology, right down to a proprietary silicon escape wheel, flat hairspring, triple parachute shock protection, and De Bethune's own white gold and blued titanium balance. Floating lugs pivoted and spring loaded on the wrist, so a variable geometry fit that tailors to your wrist. This is as good as independent watchmaking gets from a company that only makes 150 watches a year. Denis Flagiolet, the ultimate watchmaker maestro, a name for the future, and a name you need to know if you're into the independent horology scene. This brand is going places. DB28 Steel Wheels, 2018. I can't beat that, guys. Thanks to everyone who joined in. If you got up early, stayed up late, double thank you. If you watched this in a second or third language, I appreciate that. I'm still working on my French. Baby steps. Guys, thank you all. Thanks for joining in. Time out, Tim out, and thank you for logging on. Mm -hmm.